start. Anybody sitting outside, come on in and get a chair. So I am Laura Bennett. I am with Walk Austin. Thank you very much for coming. Um, we're really excited about this event, as I am sure all of you are. Um, can we, can y'all do me a favor? Um, and I want to get a feel for who's in the room. So I'll give you a softball. How many people think um, Austin could be more walkable? <laughs> Excellent, you're in the right room. All right, so how many of you are ready to roll up your sleeves and do the work necessary to make Austin more walkable? All right, hang on one second. Keep your hands up, keep your hands up. <laughs> Councilmember Chris Riley's office came to Walk Austin and said, hey, you know what would be really cool? I said, oh, what? It would be great if we could bring Jeff Speck to Austin. And I thought, yeah, that would be awesome, but who the heck is going to do that? He's a rock star. How could we ever get him here? And I think I can quote Chris saying, I don't know. You should just figure it out. <laughs> and so here we are. And uh, so we started raising money. We got this great group. Uh, Capital Metro jumped on board immediately. They really understand that they need to combine their services with walkable areas. Uh, the Imagine Austin Speaker Series, Compact and Connected, we're all trying to get there. You can't get that without being walkable. Uh, AARP, I mean, I don't even think I said anything. We just like worked it out telepathically. So they're very on board and back there. Uh, the Downtown Austin Alliance. Um, making Austin or keeping downtown uh, a vital area, much more vital than, uh, vital than having pedestrians walking around having a good time. Uh, the health community jumped right up. They understand that moving your body, walking is essential. So <laughs> St. David's Foundation and Central Health signed on. Uh, Congress for New Urbanism and Movability Austin, two great nonprofits here doing different things, um, jumped on board. And then the development community. Um, Astera Properties, Constructive Ventures, Momark Development, Southwest Strategies Group, all giant players in the Austin Development Group all wanted to um, be a part of this event. So we're really excited and I'm going to introduce my friend Councilmember Riley to um, kick it off. so much, Lauren. You know, I had no doubt when I had that conversation with Laura a while back that Lauren, that, that, that she would figure it out. That, that, that because Lauren is somebody who always figures it out. And we are going to miss Lauren so much. And I want to, for everybody who knows Lauren, everybody who's a fan of walkability in Austin that knows well Lauren's work on, on all this for, for some time now. And we're so grateful and we are going to miss you so much as you, as you venture off the, the, the thing. <laughs> We are going through so much. And today was just great. Today we actually had all kinds of rock stars here. We actually had the rock, rock stars in the fields of, of uh, uh, code writing uh, here in town. Uh, Dan, Dan Perola and, and Peter Park uh, working on, on, on Code Next. Uh, now, and now Jeff Speck here. Uh, what an exciting time as we venture forward with the rewrite of our land development code. And yet, even with all this this uh, great national star help we've got here, some people are very still a little anxious about where we're going with the rewrite of our land development code. It seems like when, when people show up and say, I'm a planner and a co-writer and I'm here to help, you don't always get the kind of reaction you might like. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and that's that's understandable. You know, it was it was over 50 years ago now when, when Jane Jacobs issued her attack on then current city planning and, and rebuilding. Uh, and yet, uh, even though her ideas sank in with many over the next couple of decades, it still seems like we're fighting many of the same old battles that she was fighting it as, as she wrote her book. We, uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that, that much of our code, much if not most of our code, uh, dates to a time when her ideas really hadn't gotten much traction. 
Uh, but the, and the idea is, and, and, they, and the old school just still lingers on in, in so many ways, where we've been having a conversation about what to do with the freeway that runs through our downtown, and at times that has had echoes of the whole Robert Moses fight about, about, having, about the effects that that's going to have on, on nearby neighborhoods. And it seems like we're, we're still fighting the same old battles that, 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 that she was fighting so long ago. It's, it's that sort of institutional inertia with the old system that Jeff Speck has spent his career combating. He spent 10 years starting, starting out with, uh, uh, with Andre Swanee and Elizabeth Tattus Eifert uh, down, down in Florida, start, starting in 1993. And many of us first got to know of, of Jeff's existence when, with, in 2000 with the issuance of, 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 the, of what is the, known to many as, as, a, as a Bible for, for urban planning of the, of the suburban nation. How many of you are, are, have, have either had suburban nation or are familiar with it? Um, yeah, most everybody who's into all this urban stuff has at least at least come across suburban nation. At you can still buy it. You <laughs> <laughs> can still buy it. It's not too hard, not too hard to find. Uh, he, after after uh, that, he came on to work as a uh, director of design at the National Endowment of the Arts from 2003 to, through 2007. He presided over the Mayor's Institute on City Design and created a new initiative, the Governor's Institute on Community Design. Uh, since then, and since 2007, he has led Speckham Associates LLC, a boutique planning firm that specializes in making downtowns more walkable. And then in uh, 2013, 2012 it was, that, that uh, he uh, did, issued another book that has uh, become very familiar to many, uh, A Waterfall City. And, okay, uh, raise your hand if, you're, if you've come across this book before. If you don't, you can definitely buy this book. Uh, and and uh, if you haven't, you really should. Uh, last year at the, at the Congress for New Urbanism in, in, in Salt Lake City, it seemed like every single session, the one work that you can count on uh, coming up in, in most every single every session there at the Congress for New Urbanism, was Walkable City. This is the, the book that everybody was talking about. Because the concept it has is just so simple. That it's just, if we can just get this one thing right, it will solve so many of our problems, and it's just a matter of, of, of basic walkability. And so it is a little more complicated than it sounds. Walk, when sometimes when we, when we talk about walkability in Austin, sometimes we're talking, but it seems like we're just focusing on whether there's a sidewalk there. Do we have a, a, a safe and a, a usable sidewalk that will get you from point A to point B? And yet there is so much more to walkability than that. Walkability has to do not just with a, 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 a useful sidewalk, it has to do with the fabric of a city. It has to do with having a place that actually puts Places within easy reach of a, of a comfortable stroll. And, uh, about the way he, the, the conditions that, that Jeff talks about are, uh, uh, we're, we're striving for a place in which a walk can be useful, safe, comfortable, and interesting. Useful, safe, comfortable, and interesting. And that turns out to be quite a challenge in many places, especially in a place like Austin, where for so many decades, so much of our development was centered strictly around the car. It was based on the, the, on the assumption that nobody would be walking anymore because everybody would be driving everywhere. And so why do you even need, 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 need to have places within, within reach of a stroll and much less uh, uh, interesting places along the way? And so it's, there, are, there are great challenges to actually creating those conditions that are right, uh, to, that will actually get us so far that we can really feel like we've created a, a, a walkable place. And yet the payoff is just so enormous. Jeff has written that uh, uh, America has so many problems, walkability solves most of them. Uh, it, it actually has offers so many solutions, and, and he will elaborate on exactly on, on what he means by that. Uh, since the time he's written, there have been others who are pointing out even more solutions that, 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 that any more, any, even more benefits to walkability. Charles Montgomery has written about how walkability actually turns out to create the condi conditions that are conducive to human happiness all over the globe, not in just in a place much of human happiness comes down to basic matters of, of walkability, just the very kinds of things that, 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 uh, that Jeff was talking about in his book. It is so important for us to make progress on, on uh, getting towards those, those conditions. It is, it is absolutely critical for the, for the present. And, um, for, it's, a, it's critical for us to think about it as we, as we strive towards the implementation of our, of our comprehensive plan and the rewrite of our, of our, our land development code. And even more important, it is so critical for the future. And there is a certain inevitability about to, to all these discussions because, uh, because the good news is for the young people in America, this is even more important than, than it is to, to, uh, to others. 
Uh, Jeff, Jeff points out that 77% of millennials plan to live in America's urban cores. 77%. And, they, and what they're looking for is, is, a, is a type of place that is different from the place, place that many of us have known for many years. It is a place that has exactly those conditions that Jeff was getting to. Making progress towards that, that, that vision would actually represent the fulfillment of, of uh, many aspects of, of the Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan. It would mean that many more Austinites would finally have the opportunity to experience the type of urban environment that Jane Jacobs described so well 50 years ago. I'm so glad that Jeff is with us here today to help nudge us along on that path as we, as we strive towards creating the kind of place that will create those conditions that are conducive to a, a, a healthy, happy city. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Chris. Well, I've never, it's the most welcome I've ever felt. And the, <laughs> the, audience, the audience of greatest width, we'll make this, get this to work, the audience of greatest width that I have ever faced. <laughs> That's not a Texas thing, is it? Um, so it's so great for me to be here. I, I don't usually butter up the audiences uh, that I talk to, but you don't, you, you could ask my friends, they will tell you Austin is Certainly the only place in Texas I would ever live. <laughs> it's my favorite place in Texas. And we're going to get into why in a minute, because it's relevant to the conversation. But um, uh, you know, I love the border towns. I've done some work in McAllen and um, in San Antonio and some other places. And everywhere along the border where you feel like you know, Mexico is close, and that's a great place to be in Texas. And I love Austin, and I really don't want to go anywhere else in Texas. And they don't really want me either. <laughs> in fact, I haven't been invited to Dallas. I haven't been invited to Houston. And it's really interesting as I've done this, really, I won't call this the book tour anymore because <clears throat> now I'm just back to doing lectures the way I've always been, been doing lectures. But uh, most people who invite me are inviting me because they've read the book um, or someone who's read the book told them to invite me. Um, but so many of the cities I go to are cities that don't need me. Because in fact, if you have the kind of city, typically, not always, and there are exceptions we'll talk about, but if you have the kind of city that can generate this kind of audience you know, in an urban church in, the, in a downtown on a weeknight and has that sort of culture that actually grows from place, um, then you're probably doing pretty well. And so the, you know, the list of the places I've spoken, with a few exceptions, uh, strangely, is a list of a lot of places that are further along on this curve. Not exclusively, though, so that's good. You know, we're spreading the message everywhere. But the challenge I face tonight, I have to rewrite, I had to rewrite the whole first part of my talk, which is about what Chris talked about. Oh, and thank you, Walk Austin, and, and let me interrupt. Um, uh, this is Lauren's last event in her job, and I really can't screw it up, so I'm very nervous <laughs> about that. But she does look like someone who's about to go to Italy tomorrow, and that's just wonderful. So, so thank you to Walk Austin. Um, but I had to rewrite the whole first part of my talk because you don't fit my mold at all. Because you have achieved, let's see, everywhere I go wants to attract millennials. And my usually, but the way I start is by saying, yes, you want millennials. You want to attract these engines of entrepreneurship. You want to attract you know, young people who make you know, almost every invention you can think of was invented by someone under 30, and you want these people in your community. And people tell me, the older people in the community, just say, how can we get our kids to stay, and how can we get our grandkids to stay? And this is the conversation that I usually launch off with. But you've already got that, and you're attracting these young people. But, and then I'm in, I'm in places all over America, and people talk about the cities they want to be like. And it's all the places that fit my mold, like, San Francisco and Portland and Washington DC and what New York City's been doing lately with its streets and Boulder. And they say Austin. I'm like, but Austin is not walkable. Okay? And this is where I might make some enemies. But by my criteria, now let me just make this clear. The stuff I've been coming here about five times for the past ten years, and what you've accomplished over that time is spectacular. And it's clear that the work that you're doing now is getting you there. Um, much faster than what 
the typical American city is doing, number one. Number two, you have great bones. You have this grid system that you've done. Someone was in our, in our, in our windshield tour today. Someone was saying, oh, you know, and we've mega blocked some of our blocks. And in fact, you've, compared to most other cities in America, you've, you've done very little. Your grid is largely intact. And so you have a framework that means that you can, you can become walkable very quickly. But in terms of all the cities that I use to sell walkability to other cities, I'd always twitch a little bit when Austin comes up. Because the typical street in Austin, frankly, looks like the typical street in the cities I'm trying to fix. Okay, So that's the challenge, is why am I right? If people are coming to Austin anyway, and if millennials are so attracted to Austin anyway, and it doesn't have many of the qualities that I use to sell walkability to cities, then what is, why is what I'm selling worth anything? And I'm thinking, I always ad lib my introductions because it's more interesting, but I can screw up very easily. <laughs> I'm thinking that, you know, it's the other things. Now, let me just interrupt to say that certain aspects of, of walkability are, what, what isn't working so well in, in Austin is just the streets, what's between the curbs. Okay? But you've got a lot of comfort and interest. You've got the interesting walk and the comfortable walk on a lot of your streets, a lot of really interesting buildings. I know that's changed over the past decade, but a lot of great spaces being framed by buildings. And then, of course, you have the tremendous arts and music and culture, and you have the fact that a liberal Jew from New England would live here, <laughs> right? And nowhere else in Texas. So you've got all these other things. You've got all these other things that add up to attracting these um, cultural creatives that are also attracted to walkability. So I think the story I have to tell here is a little bit different. It isn't that you need to become more walkable in your streets to attract these people, because you're already getting them. But you definitely have to become more walkable to give them what they truly want once they're here, and to make them want to stay even more, but actually just to give them a, to give them a better life. And Chris alluded to some of these um, of these statistics I like to use, um, you know, my generation, and this is the economist Chris Leinberger talking, my generation grew up, you know, I watched, every day I watched Gilligan's Island, Partridge Family, and The Brady Bunch. Those are the three shows I watched. Gilligan's Island had very little to say about urbanity. But the other two, <laughs> it was walkable. But the other two, the other two was what I was living. It was the suburban, you know, the low-slung house on the leafy lot, surrounded by more of the same. This was very good. And this, this generation that every city wants to attract, the millennials, well, they grew up on Seinfeld, Friends, Sex and the City. And they were a much more suburban generation than mine. In fact, the majority of suburbia was built between when I was born, you know, and when they were born. Yet this generation that grew up more suburban than me grew up wanting to live in cities because of the media they were consuming, but also, I think, because they were just stuck in the back of their parents' car so much and driving so much. And, you know, when I was, when I was young, um, one out of 12 19-year-olds opted out of getting a driver's license. Now it's one out of four. So this is the generation that, that, that the, the, you know, J.D. Powers, the folks who do the polling for the auto industry, you know, hardly part of the anti-car lobby, is saying they're not interested in cars anymore. We have to sell them something else, right? So these folks are, these folks are coming here. And I'm, I'm, I'm skipping the whole part of my talk about them. I won't skip entirely the part of my talk about the other folks who are coming into your city and certainly poised to come into your city, which is an even bigger demographic, uh, the front-end front boomers and eventually all the boomers. And what we see in the cities that have become more walkable, and I'm sure this is happening here, is that the millennials arrive first and make it safe. Safe, make it feel safe. And then their parents move in. <laughs> and that's something you're gonna, see, you're gonna see happen a lot more here in Austin. I'm sure it's already happening. These towers that you see coming downtown are too expensive for the millennials, so their parents move in. Or if you're lucky, they buy you a, <coughs> they buy you a studio. Um, so, Again, it's not, necessarily, it's not really about attracting them. It's about giving them, what they, giving them what they need. And what do they need? Well, soon they're not going to be able to drive anywhere near as well as they should drive. <laughs> and they're going to be not so comfortable driving everywhere. And there's a larger segment now of, of this generation 
who are recognizing, my own parents did it, are recognizing they can have a richer, more fulfilling lifestyle in a walkable urban environment if those streets feel safe and comfortable for them. And when you're older, because I've seen it, I've seen my kids, my three-year-old and their, my five-year-old, scooting in the crosswalks with elderly people around them. You know, they have to be comfortable in the street space, and they're very easily threatened. But if you have an accommodating street space of the kind that you don't really have yet in many of your streets, um, then they will have their needs met. And by the way, this is a phenomenon that's now 30 years old. In the early 80s, we started hearing from, from um, sociologists about something called a NORC. Has anyone heard of the NORC? The Naturally Occurring Retirement Community. And the very first one was the Upper East, that they identified in the papers was the Upper East Side of New York, where rich people who were old realized they could have a better quality of life, and they started buying it up. And that's what can happen here and will happen here, but we need to be more accommodating towards, towards what their real needs are. And their needs are streets in which they can feel safe, not just walking along, but crossing and, and in, you know, inhabiting. So I'm um, not sure if I have any more introduction, except to say, I don't want to forget, and I might forget if I don't say it now, to, to acknowledge some of the great things that I experienced that I saw had changed since when I had been here 10 years ago. Um, the Great Streets Project, two of which I walked down today, really uh, the equal of, of a, a street in Europe when you have the trees on both sides of the sidewalk and the cafe tables and really you know, more sidewalk than car area. It's fantastic. Um, the investment I'm seeing in bicycle facilities, which I think could be accelerated. Uh, the investment in transit, which we hope is accelerated. Um, Reconnect Austin, which seems to be the most obvious next step for knitting the city back together and a, really a very small investment for a very large, you know, when you spend $600 million, a lot of money, when you spend $600 million to generate $3 billion of tax base, it's a good economic, good economic model. And, and it's something that we see happening globally, really. It's the success stories that we see all around the, the world are stories like that. So these, these steps you're taking are really great. I'm going to talk tomorrow. What? Tomorrow? I'm going to talk tomorrow about the details of how to make your city more walkable. When I go to a place, I like to give two talks. And I have to apologize for the bait and switch. Um, when I'm asked to give a lecture in a place, uh, I <clears throat> speak about how that can happen, and I say, but if you're going to invite, if I'm going to come all the way out there, I want to give two talks. I want to give a talk to the entire community about why, and this is tonight's talk, why it's so important for Austin to be more walkable. I say that to every city, I just use Austin. Uh, and I say, I want to give a second talk uh, to your elected officials to your public works department, to your traffic engineers, to your key developers, to your downtown development association, to those folks about how to do it. And that's a two hour workshop, 200 slides. But I recently did it in another city and we opened the doors to everyone and it was even better, having the whole audience in there. So they don't have enough food for all of you. So you aren't allowed to eat breakfast. But it starts at 8.30 tomorrow? 8, 8.30? Okay, but breakfast is 8 to 8.30. So don't show up till 8.30 because you don't get breakfast. <laughs> but 8.30 tomorrow um, at the Ritz, is it called? At the Alamo Ritz. And it'll be a two-hour workshop on how, on how to do it. And it's, it's essentially the stuff that's in my book, but my book has no pictures, and this is, all the pic this is all the pictures. So I really do encourage a lot of you to come tomorrow because tonight you're getting the why but not the how, which is a little frustrating maybe. Um, but hopefully it will motivate you. I'm going to take off my jacket. Oh, I can't. My mic is in it. Never mind. I'll just sweat. <laughs> I've been sweating all day. So. Um, so for me, this has been a journey of not invention, but learning from other people, mostly Andres, Andres Stuani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, but, but watching what we've been doing for 20 years and what they've been doing for almost 40 and what lots of people you know, like, like Sinclair, Black, and others have been doing for many years, taking all of these lessons that I've learned um, and, and leaving design and going to work at the National Endowment for the Arts and with the Mayor's Institute on City Design and with 
dozens of mayors for four years. Every two months, somewhere in America, we would gather up eight mayors and eight designers who I'd get to pick, and we'd lock ourselves in a room, and each mayor would bring their toughest urban design challenge. We did one, we did two at UT. They host them at the wonderful architecture school at UT, Bob Patterson and Fritz Steiner and all those guys. Um, the other spec, Larry Speck, who I'm not related to, but I called him my cousin. And we would host these workshops. And in fact, the mayor of Austin came to one of them that I was at and brought the Miller Field uh, example. Is that Miller Field? Is that what it's called? The Miller Airport. Um, and, and when it was just an idea and we, we critiqued it and hopefully made it a little bit better and I hear it's coming along really well. But this experience of taking all this new urbanist stuff I had learned and then spending all these sessions every two months over four years with mayor after mayor after mayor, hundreds of mayors, and watching not the ideas change but the discussion, the, the, the language change, and realize that it's that calling it new urban is, well, first we called it neo-traditional design. That turned off, because you know, it was about bringing back neighborhoods, that turned off the liberals. Then we called it new urbanism, that turned off the conservatives. <laughs> and for a long time we just called it good urban design. But the conversation shifted in this experience with mayors and other city leaders who reframed it, not using the word, but reframed it entirely around walkability. And they would ask the question, how can we get people to walk in the city? If I have street life in my city, I know I've got a successful city. And I, I, I know it's an indicator of success, and I know it's necessary for my city to be successful. And really, my exercise with the book and um, in my practice for the past five or six years has been to reframe the argument in those terms. And I found that they just are much more actionable and instrumental than any way we've talked about it before. And I think that's what I want to talk to you about tonight a lot of the stuff I'm going to say, you, you probably know, know some of it. Some of you know a lot of it. Um, but I think I've also figured out the best way to communicate it. So even if I'm telling you something you already know, think about the way that I'm saying it, because maybe you could make these same arguments. Oh, and it is all in the book, which is for sale in the back. <laughs> so you know, for years, we as, as urban designers were kind of shouting into the wilderness and watching. You know, certainly, the new urbanists have had a profound, profound impact in the way that America is being built. But I watched year after year for many years as we would discuss these issues. And they would kind of catch on, kind of not catch on. People had some interest. Other people weren't so interested. And then I had an experience at the Sarasota Book Fair. I think it was 2000 or 2001, because Suburban Nation had just come out. And I met a guy named Robert Putnam, who's heard of Bowling Alone. So Robert Putnam was there presenting Bowling Alone. I was there presenting Suburban Nation. Bowling Alone was amazing. It said, among other things, you know, he tried to figure out why there was this decline in civic engagement that he, as a, as a demographer, that he would mapped very clearly across this country, a decline in civic engagement in America. And he, co he correlated people's participation in their communities with all these different factors in their life. And he found no stronger correlation than the length of their commute. And essentially, every 10 minutes you added to your commute, you were 10% less likely to chair an organization, to sign a petition, to you know, mother a Cub Scout den, right? And I thought that was a really interesting lesson. We were both signing books after our talks. He had a line that went down around the corner and disappeared around a building. And I had two people in front of me. It was, it was a mother. It was a father and a daughter. The mother was in prison, and they wanted to meet my publisher so they could sell her story. <laughs> and I said, I said, there's something about this social argument that's more interesting to people. As, you know, as, as fun as these stories are, there's something about this social argument that's more interesting to people than the design argument. But actually, what I've witnessed over the past 10 years is the rise of three other arguments, not design and not social, that are much more powerful at convincing cities to be more walkable. So what I want to run through tonight are these three arguments, which are an economics argument, an epidemiological argument, and an environmental argument. You know, the economists, people listen to economists. They want their cities to thrive. They want to attract people and corporations. People listen to epidemiologists because they want to live a long time. 
and people listen to environmentalists now all the more because of the climate change and extreme weather crisis that we, fa that we face. I've been told in red states to say extreme weather and not climate change, but I'm in Austin, so <laughs> I'll just say global warming, okay? The ice caps are melting. It's true. So not everyone listens to all three of these groups, but they're groups that people listen to more than they listen to even Robert Putnam, and certainly more than they listen to folks like me. So the start of, of Walkable City is actually these three arguments. The first chapter is the economics argument, the second chapter is the health argument, the, third, the ch third chapter is the environmental argument. Then the whole rest of the book is how you do it, and that's my talk tomorrow. So I'm going to skip the whole we're trying to attract millennials, blah, 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 blah discussion. You've heard it. There's a whole another discussion in that about how the, you, you all know about walk score. You know, every, Amer every neighborhood in America is rated in terms of its walkability. There's now, thanks to walk score, we can now correlate the value of properties against walkability. It's very clear that people place a huge premium on more walkable cities. So if you want your city to be more, now affordability is a whole other discussion, but if you want your city to be more valuable, then certainly walkability is an important part of that. But there's a whole nother discussion, which is kind of the negative economic discussion, which is, what have we done in America? You know, we've doubled the number of roads in this country since 1970. And in so doing, we've doubled the distance that the typical American drives every day. And we've doubled the amount that the typical American spends on transportation. So when I was young in the 70s, the typical American spent one-tenth of their income on transportation. You know, since then, we've been investing, investing, investing in roadways and the typical American now spends, American now spends one-fifth of their income on transportation. Working Americans who are described as earning between um, twenty and fifty thousand um, dollars now spend a little bit more on transportation even than they do on housing. And poor Americans are spending forty percent of their income on transportation. We've burdened our society with this need to drive. And it's the poorest, well, particularly the working Americans who fall into this trap that I'm sure you're quite aware of and maybe you've heard of that's called drive till you qualify, where, where you have to go further and further and further from the city center to, a, to meet the bank's lending requirements, to find a house that's cheap enough to meet the bank's lending requirements. And then, of course, you go underwater and you go underwater in the mortgage. And then you're trapped because you haven't done the math. Some do, some don't, but many of them haven't done the math and realized that much of the savings that they get from the house mortgage being cheaper, they're actually doubling down in transportation costs. And these are the communities, these exurban communities, you're probably aware of some, that were hit the hardest, that were actually devastated and half, half emptied by the housing crash in 2008. Because their mortgages all went underwater, the price of gasoline went up markedly at the same time, if you remember. And all of a sudden, they couldn't afford the lifestyle that they had, they had bought into. So a tremendous burden on our society. And if you even go back to the 70s, uh, a gr great writings by um, the multinational intellectual Ivan Illich. Have you heard of Ivan Illich? He calculated out, and even back in the 70s, if you take all the time that the typical American spends to earn his car, and then stuck in traffic driving his car, that he walks, that he drives the same speed as a person, that, sorry, that he, he moves the same speed as a person walking in a pre-industrial society. So in fact, we spend then 10%, now 20% of our wealth on moving no faster than we ever moved before. And we're doing it at the cost of all these other things that we could be spending money on. Because 85%, 84% of the money you spend on driving leaves the local economy instead of staying in the local economy. So we've really burdened our country. And when it comes to being competitive into the future as oil reaches $200 a, a barrel and <clears throat> we begin perhaps due to weather events to have to curtail our moving around, we've burdened ourselves and put ourselves in a, at a disadvantage to other nations in terms of the great wealth that's been invested. In fact, I like to say that our, you know, thanks to the money we're spending on, on fuel, uh, they're building glorious transit systems in Dubai and Abu Dhabi 
that our, our cars have essentially bought their trains. But that's the sad story, but there's a positive, there, there's a positive corollary, which is what does it mean in America, and it's been done in America, what does it mean in America if you decide to take a different path? And you may be tired of hearing about Portland. So Austin and Portland are almost always in the same sentence, wherever you go. Um, but Portland is the best example we have in the US of a city that made a series of decisions actually back in the 70s, decisions that most cities, most advanced cities are making now. But they made a bunch of decisions back in the 70s to become less auto dependent. So while the typical American city then was building highways, they said we're going to stop building highways and we're going to build transit and bikeways. In fact, they did build, they rebuilt one cloverleaf. They built, they invested $65 million in, in bikeways, which sounds like a lot of money, but it was over 30 years, so about $2 million a year, and half the price of that one cloverleaf that they rebuilt, actually for $140 million. But they invested in bikes and transit. If you've been to Portland, you know, great streetcar, great light rail, and great buses, while everyone else was investing in highways. While every other American city was growing this undifferentiated spare tire of suburban sprawl, they instituted their now famous urban growth boundary. Right? Series of decisions around driving less. Well, what's happened was, since making those decisions, uh, their lifestyle has actually changed. They went from biking the same as the rest of America, really not so much different from the rest of America, only slightly more, to biking 15 times as much as the rest of America. As recently as a decade ago, only 8% of kids in Austin walked or biked to school. The numbers came in from last year, 43% of the kids in Austin, sorry, in Portland, not Austin, Portland. <laughs> Start over. <laughs> That's probably right, though, about Austin. Let me back up. When I was a kid, half of us walked or biked to school. More recently, about 13% of Americans walk or bike to school. You're probably somewhere in there. So Portland went in a decade from 8% to 43% because of this decision. But interestingly, you know, we've hit peak VMT. We've hit, as a nation now, in almost every city and almost every region, we're, dry, we're starting to drive less. In many cities that hit in 2008, some places I'm working, it hit last year. Uh, and by the way, any, any, anyone telling you that you need to widen the highway or leave room around a highway to widen it later doesn't understand that we've hit peak, peak VMT. Right? In Portland, they hit peak VMT in 1996 and they started going downhill from there. So that they now drive 20% less than they did before and 20% 20, 20 less than the rest of the, of the country. So what does that mean? An economist named Joe Courtright, he did the math and he found out that that 20% less, which is four miles a day or 11 miles a day, the typical commute went from 54 minutes round trip to 43 minutes round trip, that those 11 minutes and the, the um, four miles add up to fully 3.5% of all GDP, all income earned in the area. So what are they spending that money on? Knowing again that 84% of what you spend on cars <laughs> leaves the local economy. Well, Portland, you probably know, is reputed to have the most coffee shops per capita, the most independent bookstores per capita. And let's hear it for your independent bookstore, which I guess is second only to Powell's in the country, is the largest. That's great. Buy a book from them tonight. What's it called? Book What's it? People. What? Book people. Book people. Um, they uh, are reputed to have the most roof racks per capita. They're reputed to have the most strip clubs per capita. Uh, these are all slight exaggerations of a truth, which is that they are spending more on almost every kind of recreation than the rest of America. Oregonians spend more on alcohol than most Americans which could be a good thing or a bad thing, but it makes you glad they're driving less. <laughs> um, and that's the, kind of, that's the kind of lifestyle changes that you can see when you make those change, when you make those decisions to change the way your city is growing. And there are much bolder examples in Vancouver, in Toronto, in Sydney, Melbourne, and of course in European cities, which actually <clears throat> never even thought about sprawling. And I'll be talking more about them as we go. So tremendous economic impacts. And then there's just the fact that, and this is very hard to 
maybe articulate, but very hard to, um, to prove. But this concept that just the sheer propinquity of walkable cities, the fact that being among each other and close together makes us more productive. Um, the, evidence is, the evidence is coming in. You know, David Brooks did a, uh, reported on a study where a bunch of folks were brought together. One group, well, they did it with lots of groups, but one bunch of groups uh, were brought together over the internet and asked to perform this very difficult cooperation challenge. And groups were also brought together face to face and asked to do the same test. And of course, the face to face groups thrived and succeeded, and the internet groups splintered and fell apart. So there's a real value to bringing things together. And then there's just the sheer efficiency. You know, in Europe, I've done it. In Amsterdam, you can have five meetings in a day. You know, in Atlanta, you can have two meetings in a day because they're on the opposite side of Atlanta and you're stuck in traffic getting between them. And, and so that's, that's a f factor as well. But now there are these theoretical physicists, West and Betancourt, who's, who have done the math and they actually are proclaiming, it was in the New York Times Magazine, that these cities that have chosen to grow along the more dispersed model, like Phoenix, like Riverside, California, which has a ton of people in it, by the way. I know you haven't really heard of Riverside, but it's bigger than most cities. Um, that these cities are actually performing, that the cities that have, that, have, that have invested in spreading out and providing everyone the suburban lifestyle are the ones that are reporting the lowest production of patents, you know, the lowest amount of inventiveness. And actually, the EPA reported, the more you drive in a given state, the worse that state performs economically. And you think it might be the opposite, because you know, driving is something we can do when we have money. But in fact, the more you drive in your state, the worse your state is doing economically. So there's many more arguments I could, I could make. But the, the fundamental one is that you want to be investing your money locally, not in you know, the tar sands and not in Saudi Arabia. And you also want to be even more of what you already are, which is a cool place to be. And the, the places where people want to be, because of this demographic perfect storm of pre-kid millennials and post-kid boomers who don't care about yards, school, <coughs> schools, or big houses, but care about access to transit and a walkable lifestyle, that they, they want to be in that kind of city. So that's my economic argument, and it's the, it's the longest one. I'll be speeding up now. <clears throat> I like to say the best day to be a planner in America was August 9th, 2004, when a book came out. Three doctors, actually two doctors, two epidemiologists and a planner, Frank Frumkin and um, Dick Jackson, who some of you may have heard speak, came out with this book called Urban Sprawl and Public Health. And while many of us have been you know, shouting into the wilderness for many years about the waste and the anime and the ugliness of suburban sprawl, they said it very simply, that sprawl is, is killing us as a nation. It's making us morbid. We have, you know, we spend one out of every six dollars in this country on health care, and yet we have some of the worst statistics, health statistics in the, in the developed world. And yes, there are ways we could spend less money on health care, but it, why is a nation that's so wealthy performing so badly in so many metrics? You've probably heard a lot of the, the statistics. Um, one third of Americans are now obese. A second third of the population is overweight. Fully one third of all children born after the year 2000 are expected by the CDC to become di diabetic. It's kind of scary. 25% of young men right now and 40% of young women are too heavy to enlist in our own armed forces. And the story goes on and on and on. But for too long, these doctors were telling us, for too long now, it's been a story about diet. About, and, and God knows this is true. And you know, Michael Pollan and that whole discussion about the, the, the dangerous American fructose diet uh, is all true. But it's been the vast majority of the discussion has been about diet. And very little has been about inactivity or actually inactivity born of the built environment. Inactivity that results from the fact that we have essentially legislated and built out of existence in so many of our communities the useful walk. And so we have no opportunities to walk. People aren't walking. <clears throat> One study you know, looked at inactivity versus 
diet. It was a British study called Gluttony versus Sloth, and it very carefully <laughs> documented that it was inactivity and weight that were fluctuating together, much more so than diet and weight. Uh, Dr. James Levine, in, the, in this case aptly named Mayo Clinic, uh, put his patients in electronic underwear, and he held their diet steady and he held their weight steady, you know, hundreds of patients. And then he started pumping, pumping the calories in. Some patients gained weight, some patients didn't gain weight. And looking for some metabolic or DNA factor at work, the only thing that he could find that distinguished the patients from each other was how much they were moving every day. And those who gained weight, on average, were sitting for two hours longer than those who didn't, which sounds like a commute in many American cities. So we have these, these studies that link weight more so to inactivity than to diet. But now we have these studies that link weight to actually where you live. Thanks to walk score, they were able to rate different neighborhoods of San Diego as more walkable and less walkable. If you lived in a more walkable neighborhood of San Diego, you were 35% likely to be overweight. If you lived in a less walkable neighborhood, you were 60% likely to be overweight. And now the doctors have a term for these places, obesogenic. These are called obesogenic neighborhoods. Study over six years, 100,000 people, in the Boston area, you can just draw the rings around the city like a dartboard. The length of the commute and the distance from the city and both the, you know, the, la the less opportunities for walking in the suburbs and the amount of commuting you're doing when you live in the suburbs is making you just each ring is heavier than the one outside of it. And these are, these are you know, academic studies that zero out for wealth and <clears throat> age and other things that correlate with body mass. So these are very useful studies. So that's part of it, and obviously the solution to, to obesity and obesity-related illnesses born of location is in the short term to move to a different location. You know, I'm a bad poster child for this discussion because I've always been trying to gain weight <laughs> in my life. Um, I've always been too skinny, but when I lived in Miami, I gained some weight, and when I moved to Washington, and switch from driving to transit, I lost the six pounds that is the average that Americans lose when they switch from driving to riding in transit. So the short-term solution is to move to a city. The longer-term solution, of course, is to make, to make all of your places more walkable. Now, we also have an asthma epidemic in this country. Seven percent of Americans have asthma. We lose 14 people to asthma every day, um, which didn't seem like that many to me until I heard that it was three times the rate of 1990. Okay, three times as many asthma deaths as in 1990. And it's asthma from car, principally from car exhaust. American pollution isn't what it used, used to be. It comes now from tailpipes, not, not from factories. And where you live in relation to large highways and other areas where people are driving a lot, and frankly, in metropolitan areas where people are driving a lot, determines how likely you are to get asthma. And it's these cities, these most sprawling cities, like Atlanta, that are suffering the most. And in Atlanta, you know, it's funny, I was in Atlanta in 1996 for the Olympics, and the population of the city increased by 50% during that time of the Olympics. Yet the asthma hospitalizations dropped by 30%. Because Atlantans, being told that it would be impossible to drive around the center of the city, drove less. And so the air cleared up. And Atlanta's been a constant, constant battle of people suffering, failing to meet federal clean air standards, being told they couldn't build highways anymore, people getting healthy again, so they got the right to build more highways and people getting sick again. <laughs> and Phoenix put Atlanta to shame. About five years ago, they had, they had a year in which four full months of days, healthy people were told not to leave their houses. And if you look at WebMD's list of the 10 actually the five cities in which you're most likely to have asthma, and the list of America's most sprawling cities, they overlap. Or I should say, the statistic I have in my book is, the cities in which, the WebMD cities in which you are most likely to have asthma, the five cities, people drive 27% more than the five cities in which you're less likely to have asthma. So that's a very clear correlation as well. And then finally, there's the car crash discussion, which we should think of as a health crisis because it is. Uh, we're losing more young Americans uh, to car crashes than anything else. 3.3 <clears throat> million uh, since there have been cars. 
And um, we kind of take it for granted that it's just part of being alive, that you know, actually there's a 0.5%, there's a 1 in 200 chance that you will die in a car crash. There's a 50% a chance that you will be injured at some point in your life in a car crash. You say, oh, this is part of being out on the road. Well, guess what? Our car crash statistic is 14, actually more recently, 12 deaths. It's been getting better, but not for pedestrians, but for drivers it's been getting better. 12 deaths per 100,000 in the U.S. It's not so, per year, not so bad. Well, Germany, with its no speed limit autobahn, is seven deaths per 100,000. England is four deaths per 100,000. Germany's got three deaths per 100,000. New, New York City, maybe Holland too. But New York City has saved more lives in traffic since September 11, 2001 than were lost on September 11, 2001. If the whole nation shared New York City's traffic death rate, we'd save 24,000 lives per year. Because yes, they drive less in New York, but also it's the kind of roads you're driving on. You know, oh, so, so living in a city as opposed to the countryside or the suburb makes us safer. Well, sure, New York is three, San Francisco is three, Portland is three, Tulsa is 14, Orlando is 20. So it's not whether you're in a city or not, it's in what kind of city do you live. Do you live in a city that was designed around walking and transit, or do you live in a city that was designed around cars? Because it's the cities that were designed around cars that it turns out are the most effective at smashing them into each other. And that's a really <clears throat> important thing to think about. You know, we move to the suburbs because it's safer for our kids. Yet actually, the, they did the math, if you add up car crash deaths and crime, murder by stranger, you're safer in the grittiest inner city than you are in the country club suburbs in almost every American metropolitan area. The, the 10 safest places to be in Virginia are its eight toughest cities and the two counties up against Washington, D.C., if you add together car crashes and violent crime. <clears throat> so you get the point. In the short term, you want to live longer, be healthier, breathe easier, move to the city. In the longer term, make your, where you live more walkable. Then finally, the environmental argument, which is so fascinating because I'm old enough to have watched the environmentalists just kind of turn on a dime in this country and change their message. Because the environmental movement in America has traditionally been an anti-city movement. And if you've been around for a while, you know that. You know, starting with Jefferson, who said cities are pestilential to the health, to the morals, to the liberties of man. If we continue to pile upon ourselves in cities as they do in Europe, we shall become as corrupt as they are in Europe and take to eating one another as they do there. <laughs> <clears throat> he had a sense of humor. I don't think he meant it, really. <laughs> and then, you know, this whole idea, you know, the, the, the environmental movement in America has been an Arcadian movement. It's been about moving to nature, uniting with nature, becoming one. In the history of the Sierra Club, and Thoreau, and all of that. And this message was only hammered home more strongly when we started mapping carbon. And a typical carbon mapping project, like the Vulcan project in uh, Birmingham, where they map carbon per square foot, per square mile, actually, across the country. And you look at these carbon maps of the country, and they're, they're like the night sky photographs of the country. You know, red hot in the cities, kind of mellow orange in the suburbs, dead black in the countryside. Because, of course, where there's more people, there's more carbon. But a few years ago, really about eight years ago, uh, Scott Bernstein, an economist in Chicago, said, is this really the right way to map carbon? And there, there are only so many of us in the country at, at any given time, and we can live in places, perhaps, that causes us to have a smaller or a larger carbon footprint. Let's map it per household. And when he mapped carbon per household, and he did it across hundreds of American cities, from Abilene to Yuma, when you map carbon per household, the map's entirely flipped. Black in the center cities, warm in the suburbs, and red hot in these ex-urban drive to you qualify communities. And now the environmental establishment has understood this 
<clears throat> and is starting to point at what's called location efficiency. And the idea that where you live actually has the biggest impact on how you live. The EPA came out with a brochure, I guess it was around 2004, called Boiling It Down to BTUs, Location Efficiency and Building Type. And it said, where are you most likely to have the lightest footprint? In a green lead house, driving a Prius or not, in living in the city, living in the country. And they found out that you could have the greenest house in the suburbs, complete with Prius, and you still have a bigger footprint than if you live in the middle of the city in the least green house. So it's great that the EPA is spreading this message on location efficiency. It'd be nice if people were listening, for example, the EPA, <laughs> who two months after that report came out, took its 670 employee Sector 7 headquarters in Kansas City, downtown Kansas City, and moved it 20 miles out of town into Lenexa, Kansas, walk score 27, into a former Applebee's office park because it was a lead building. And this, in a nutshell, I think epitomizes the way that we've gotten the environmental discussion wrong in this country, is that it's always been about the lead rating. And you know, lead is, lead is good, you know, but, but lead is not enough. And we've focused, as we like to do in America, on the gizmos, on the stuff we can buy. And politicians and marketers have sold, have sold sustainability to us in terms of a marketing decision, a lifestyle decision. What can I buy to add to what I already have to make my footprint lighter, right? <laughs> and you know, I'm not immune to this. We all, it's very attractive, this concept, what, what Steve Muzan uh, calls gizmo green, right? Um, when my wife and I were building our new house in the District of Columbia on an abandoned lot in the heart of the city, and we've got the bamboo floors, We've got the dual flush toilets, we've got the solar photovoltaic system, the solar water heater, the double insulation. We've got the, um, oh, you know, energy saver bulbs. A wood log crackling in our German high-tech stove contributes less carbon to the atmosphere than were it left alone to decompose in the forest. That's what the brochure says. <laughs> Yet all of these gizmos together don't contribute a fraction of what we contribute by living three blocks from metro in the heart of a walkable city. And that's the message that we, that we need to share. You, know, you can change all your light bulbs to energy savers, and you should, but you save as much energy in a year changing all your light bulbs to energy savers as you do in a week moving to a walkable neighborhood in your city. So if you compare, if you care about this sort, if you care about sustainability, then the answer, your choice is clear. But the problem is, you know, barring some tragical circumstance of unprecedented horror, I think it's gonna be very hard to get Americans to make different choices about any sustainability argument that's wrapped up in being good. Right? You know, we, those of us who lived through the last energy crisis in the 70s knew it was about turning down the thermostats, wearing sweaters, um, taking short, cold showers. It was miserable. And you can't sell, you can't, you can't say, oh, you'll be an angel, so you should do this. That doesn't work because it's so hard to picture what could happen. So how can we have a discussion in this country around sustainability that's, that's, that's a positive one, that's encouraging? Well, the gold standard of quality, life, quality of life surveys is called the Mercer Survey. It's published in some black box somewhere secret. It's called a quality of life survey. It rates all the global cities, all the medium size and larger cities in terms of 10 criteria that they've determined add up to quality of life. Housing, access to nature, health care, schools, stable government, weather, transportation, all of these things. This survey, um, it's interesting, it tends to always be won by a bunch of places where they speak German. Zurich, Dusseldorf, Vienna. The top ranking American city, excuse me, um, 
Most recently, I think it was Honolulu, ranked number 28, followed shortly thereafter by the usual suspects, Boston and San Francisco and Washington, D.C. and Portland, Seattle, the cities you're, you're always hearing about. There was not a non-walkable, not a driving American city on the list. Okay? And then there's a bunch of cities that do really well also, like Vancouver and the cities in Canada and Australia and New Zealand. Now, this is interesting. New York City, we talked about how healthy it is in terms of car crashes. People in New York City consume gasoline at a rate the rest of this country hasn't done since the 20s. They consume, you know, a third of the electricity of Houston. New York City is our densest city. It has 480 subway stops, which is more than all the other subway stops in the country put together. But there are other cities that we know about that are less dense that actually perform better. So while New York City, well, you know, while our cities burn half the fuel of our suburbs, and New York City burns half the fuel of the typical American city, Canadian cities like Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver burn half the fuel of those cities. So do cities in Australia. European cities, like the Dusseldorfs and the Viennas, burn half again as much fuel. And then you can go to Hong Kong and burn half again as much fuel. And I like to joke that if 10 Hong Kongers moved to New York wanting to keep their gasoline consumption steady, nine of them would have to stay home all day. The point is that you can actually do much better than they do in New York. So it's interesting to look at this quality of life survey and see these German cities doing so well and Canadian cities doing better than American cities in terms of like being the kind of place where, where people want to live. Well, there's another quality of life survey. It's the economists quality of life survey. They use the Mercer data. They just have a slightly different criteria. They warp it. They're accused of being somewhat Anglophone in their tendencies, or I should say Anglophile in their tendencies. So places where they speak English does better, which isn't much of a help to the US, it turns out. But the, winner, <laughs> the winners tend to be Canadian or Australian. The winner last year was Vancouver. And Vancouver paints a really fascinating story because it's the, it's the, Uber, it's the more Portland than Portland. Vancouver made a series of decisions starting in the 50s, first to not let the highways land, right? No highways land and lace through Vancouver. And by the way, in the 1950s, you have to trust me on this one, I wasn't there either. The 1950s, Vancouver looked just about like every other North American city. But then they said, we're not going to let the highways land, and then we're going to do two things, three things. We're going to, invent, we're going to encourage developers to build high-rise housing in our downtown and make it easy for them. But if they're going to do that, we're going to take the money from that and invest it heavily in transit, and we're going to invest it heavily in the public realm. Streets, squares, parks. And now if you've been to Vancouver, you know it's a city of spiky buildings, of great transit, of great parks. This, this, this project really kicked into full speed about, well, really in the 90s, when they went from having 15% of all trips in the city being walking trips to 30% of all trips being walking trips. So it's an amazingly sustainable city in that regard. So I look at this and I look at their low consumption of gasoline and their lighter carbon footprint and I have to ask, you know, is, is Vancouver more livable? Does it have a higher quality of life because it's so sustainable? And I, think, I say no. The same things, the same thing that gives Vancouver a higher quality of life is what makes it so sustainable. And that's the fact that it's a walkable city. So, you know, is, is sustainability a function of, of, I should say, is our quality of life a function of our sustainability? I should say it's not. But if in this country we are so unsustainable because we're throwing away so much of our time and our money and our lives on the highway, then these two problems would seem to share the same solution, which is to make our cities more walkable. Doing so isn't easy, as you know, but it can be done, it has been done, as I've described, and it is being done in many American cities at this very moment, and yours as well, as we speak. But I think we could do it with greater vigor, and I'm here to help you do that. Thank you for your attention.
I think I talked longer than I was supposed to, but I welcome questions. So it's interesting you talked about start off with some social, and you talked about some economic, ecological, these other variables. But I'm interested in some political issues in terms of the fragmented metropolis, about how cities, especially in this area, tend to competing with one another, the tax revenue, and things like that. And in your experience working with mayors, has that issue ever come up? And what kind of solutions have you guys worked out in terms of dealing with that and implementing a lot of those It's really tough and it's going to be tough for you in the context of the change that's about to happen to your government, which I've just learned about. I'm no expert on, on things Austin. Um, and I'm not saying that what's happening with your um, structure of your city councilor system is a bad thing, but it makes you more like the other cities I've seen where um, you have a city council like in Oklahoma City, where I'm working, you have a city council where the, the vast majority of the city councilors actually represent suburban interests. And their biggest concern day to day about the city is that they can zip in and out of it quickly. But they're not necessarily uh, as invested in the quality of the downtown as you might have under the current scenario. This was something that surprised us when Toronto consolidated. And you know, we talk about the need, we, we as planners, we talk about the need for regional government because we live our lives regionally. You know, I used to wake up in Miami Beach and commute to Miami and then go to swim in Coral Gables and then go back to Miami Beach. And this is a typical American experience is to go from municipality to municipality but within one region. So we always said, why can't we govern regionally? Well, in Toronto, I guess in the 90s, they switched from a government more like the one you had now. To it. They consolidated with their suburbs. They made a bolder move. And all the planners hailed it as this great, as this great victory. And thus became Rob Ford. <laughs> and actually, that's not the punchline I usually use. But what we've seen in the, past, in the past 20 years is that the city interests have been continually outvoted by the suburban interests. And it's very hard to make those tough decisions that benefit the downtown and those of us who study these things know will benefit, will ultimately benefit the region much more than if the downtown is starved. So Mayor Mick Cornett in Oklahoma City, where we've done a ton of investment in walkability, and I'll be showing it tomorrow, um, he just says to his fellow city councilors, look, do you want to be a suburb of nothing? Right? And he makes the point that, and this is actually an Andres Duany point, that the downtown of the city, no matter where you live in the city, the downtown of the city is the one part of the city that belongs to everybody. You've got the place where you live, but you've got the downtown too. It's really yours, and you know it's yours. Your pride in your city, how you sell your city, is based on the quality of that downtown. So that's a conversation to have as these changes are occurring. Um, to understand, I'm not going to talk about how you can compete against the Houstons and the Dallases, and frankly, I think you're doing just fine. But looking at your region, um, the suburban interests have to be reminded that the ship rises and falls together. Yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eric Anderson. Um, how does Austin uh, deal with this challenge when we uh, take a moment to acknowledge that uh, our population density is one-sixth that of San Francisco, less than one-half of Portland. Cities we uh, apparently, or I certainly aspire that our city might become. And if you look at, that's just city limits. If you look at the region, it's probably way worse. Uh, only Fort Worth is more sprawled than Austin. Uh, Houston, Dallas, uh, San Antonio are both, are all more dense. Than, than Austin. Uh, how, how do we deal with this in, in, in light of what you just mentioned, that we're going to a 10-1 system that many of us have great hopes for as a game changer, and yet there's this dark side? What matters when you're talking about density, and a lot of people get this wrong, the question was essentially how can Austin, which is less dense than many other cities, after all I've said about the benefits of propinquity, how can it compete against other cities that are denser? Um, 
people often make that calculation ignoring the degree to which a city has grown or annexed its suburbs. So actually there are a lot of cities, the cities that we know as the most dense, the Philadelphias and the Bostons and the San Francisco's, are precisely those cities that haven't annexed their suburbs. But if you look at them regionally, they're not all that different from you. So the question shouldn't be, what's our density as a city? Because where you draw your city limits typically is the biggest thing determining that outcome. The question should be, what are our local densities? And do those local densities support walking, support neighborliness, support transit? Very interestingly, um, you know, the, the, there's a um, famous chart that planners use that it maps density like this, and it maps fuel use like this. And as you might imagine, it's a downward angle. The denser your city is, the less gasoline it uses. But in fact, it's a super swoopy curve. It drops off precipitously as you start to get dense, and then it starts dropping off less and less and less. And actually, the, the, the savings in fuel from going from two units per acre to 20 units per acre is as much savings as going from 20 to 200 units per acre. Because we urbanists know, you know, 20 units per acre is your normal kind of urban density of apartments, of row houses, of even some single family homes. If you have a traditional neighborhood of apartments, row houses, and single family homes, you're probably around a 10 to 20 units per acre. So it's that shift from the driving, you know, half acre lots and one acre lots and two acre lots to that moderate density of 10 to 20 units per acre that has the biggest impact on your fuel use and I would say on all those other factors that correlate with density. So we want to look to bring, it, bring densities up to neighborhood scales, to focusing on those places where it was designed in a way that neighborhood activity and walking and, and not being dependent on the automobile is possible. And don't worry so much about the density as a region. I know that's not all the questions. They seem to be focused on this side of the room. This isn't so much a question as uh, more of a comment based on two things you mentioned. Uh, one being, uh, you, you mentioned Vancouver encouraged uh, the building of high rises, and it seems like our city council and the way our city code is, it actually discourages high rises, and it makes it difficult um, for developers to build high rises. So how do you recommend we go about changing that opinion and making it easier? I mean, if anything, really, the way it's written is backwards from what it should be to encourage a uh, walkable environment. Right now, downtown, we're limited on a base zoning of eight to one floor area ratio. And if you want to go above that, you have to provide community benefits when really it should be the other way around. If you want to build less than that, then you need to build community benefits because you're not maximizing the land area and making an area more walkable and more accessible to more people. Well, and that has an impact on what you mentioned earlier about having our parents buy us that studio, because by adding all these, uh, in, uh, all these expenses to development, you're making development more expensive. Right now, it's a lot easier and cheaper to go build a 300 acre master plan community in Calabuta than it is to build a high rise, and it's also a lot more profitable. Yeah. Just some things to think about. I understand the intellectual discussion, and that you're right, by underutilizing a parcel of land, you should be forced to somehow contribute in some other way. However, um, practically speaking, I don't find that's a fruitful angle to take. Uh, I would say the way to sell high-rise is to truly manifest and celebrate the contributions to civic beauty and connectedness that those high-rises can contribute. So I do believe in, and I think the developers in the audience also would believe in um, being asked to contribute more money to transit, to street quality, to parks and open spaces in exchange for building more density. But it has to be sold to the public in a very clear and celebratory way. This is what you're getting in exchange for this, this tower. It's, Jeff, not, it's not that easy, though. Jeff, uh, you, we've already talked about the change with our electoral system. And I think you mentioned urban rail and Project Reconnect. 
Another major thing that's happening in the background is we are rewriting our land development code. I'm not sure how many people in here have heard about Code Next, uh, but it's one of the most important things about shaping our city. So if we were going to make one change with regard to Code Next to make Austin more walkable, I know you don't know our land development code, but if we were a typical American city, what would be the one major change that you would suggest if we were a typical American city rewriting its land development code? And I want to acknowledge that you've got a really great new comprehensive plan. Is that what it's, is that what it's called, the comp comprehensive? Imagine Austin. That one, and I've been on the jury, I know this is, it may not mean anything to you, but the APA gave it their best comp plan award this year, which is a wow. huge, a huge honor. <laughs> And, and then you have, you know, as someone who used to do this for a living, I can say, you can take it from me when I say the team that's writing your, uh, rewriting your code is the best or, or one of the, one, I'd say one of the very, very best uh, firms in the nation that do this sort of work. Um, so you're in very good hands there. And <clears throat> if you're not aware, what they're doing is um, essentially turning your statistical and legalese-based code into what's called a form-based code that deals much more directly with how buildings shape the public realm. Because at a certain point, the planners figured out that the FAR can be irrelevant and you know so many other things which our zoning codes control can be irrelevant if the building doesn't just step up to the sidewalk, hug the street, put the parking in the back, and do all those other things that make for convivial public spaces. So uh, I would suspect that this code is going to do this anyway. But I asked as we walked up, is it called Lamar? Yeah, so I saw the good, the bad, and the ugly today. Um, <laughs> the ugly was Lamar, although there's some really neat buildings landing on it that are doing the right thing. And I asked, you know, these new buildings that are landing on Lamar, are they required by the code to hide the parking in the back? And actually, uh, the answer I got was uncertain, but I, I suspect very strongly the new code will put the parking in the back. But the biggest challenge, that's the easy answer. But the biggest question, which is harder to answer, is what every city now is fighting with that's a walkable city is parking minimums versus maximums. And you can't make a city get rid of parking if the alternatives aren't good. So it has to be a two-part deal. And you've got to enhance your transit, enhance your key bus, you know, BRT corridors. I mean, you're doing it. You need to do more of it. You need to create a circumstance where the choice to not have a car is a good choice. Then, as you do that, you need to eliminate parking minimums and potentially introduce parking maximums, which is something that other American cities are doing and, and have done. But it's really got to really be a, a two-part deal. And I should say, don't, in any neighborhood, even start to talk about this without first getting all the neighbors together and saying, we're going to make a parking preservation plan for you. <laughs> you, who currently live in this you who currently live in this neighborhood and who park on this street, you will not lose this spot on this street. Because we're going to institute a parking permit system that's available only to prior residents, and there's a, there's a dozen different ways to do it. And they work. We're doing it in Washington, DC. You know, our on-street parking, we have a car now, and our on-street parking is preserved as thousands of units land around us because of this resident-only, previous, re prior resident-only, what do you call it, a P-R-O-P-P, -P, prior resident-only parking permit. But I've got one other interesting point to make on this topic, if I may, which is that in walkable cities, in cities with good transit, and they don't have to be super dense, in, in Somerville, Massachusetts, actually, Somerville is super dense, but it's three stories tall, in Somerville, Massachusetts, outside of Boston, which has great transit, the city chief planner was telling me the story he'd seen. And I've subsequently heard the same story in Washington, DC. Two developers came, built two different buildings. One developer said, no, no, my tenants, you know, I like to provide parking for my tenants. My bank requires it, whatever. And he put in one parking space per unit. Another developer came and said, I don't think I need it, and put in no parking spaces per unit. Of course, the neighbors were so upset about the no parking spaces per unit. Oh, these folks are going to be parking on our street. Well, guess what happened? Everyone who moved into the building with the parking spaces were people who owned cars. They brought their cars, and then they parked them on the street. 
everyone who moved into the building with no parking spaces, were the people who self-selected to live in those buildings didn't own cars, weren't going to own cars, don't contribute to parking on the street or tra traffic in the street because they arrive without cars. So as sectors of your city, and some of them are there now, not the whole city is for sure, but as sectors of your city become more walkable, you need to understand that actually the parking requirement can make it harder for current residents to maintain the status quo on their streets. feelings about preservation of um, older, I'll call them <coughs> urban, suburban neighborhoods, you know, maybe like, like High Park, Clarksville, you know, there's a number of different neighborhoods all over town, and um, if there's any influence on trying to preserve those and walkability of different areas. You know, I don't talk much about preservation because I kind of feel like most people get it. Like, most people understand the value of that, yet... Every day we see these, we're seeing wonderful houses and other buildings torn down. The, the, uh, so it's not, a, it's not an expertise of mine, but I will share with you the best thing I ever heard, which is the economist Donovan Ripkema. Has, anyone, has he ever spoken here? Don Ripkema. And he's an economist. He happens to focus on preservation, but he's an economist first. And what he says is that in, that in competitive economies, it's the di differentiated product that commands a price premium. Right? In competitive economies, it's the differentiated product that commands a price premium. Well, think about America and what we Can you hear me? Yeah. Think about, am I, think about America, oh, I'll trade with you. <laughs> think about America and what we've built for the past 60 years. And every part of America looks exactly like every other part of America. There's almost no reason to travel anymore. You know, one, certainly one suburban ring around one city is exactly the same as the next. But what makes the cities different, frankly, is this pre-war, really pre-1950s, I would say mostly, with some exceptions that are later, um, pre-1950s stock of buildings and houses. And so what, what sells you as a city to people who are into tourism or people who just want to live in a cool place are those older buildings that make you different. So every old building you tear down is eliminating some of your economic advantage over other places. And that was the most convincing argument that I've heard from an, econ from an economist about that. One more? One more. One more. Yes, over here. You just shout. Well, thank you for giving me that last question, which is an easy question, because I think you kind of answered it, but I think most people in the room would say that that's, that is a um, way of thinking that is becoming less common. And particularly as the millennials become dominant, a lot of us are fearing that. But as the, as the millennials become dominant in our society, um, and polls clearly show that you know the iPhone is the new car, and that driving and frankly even home ownership is not viewed at all in the same positive way it was by prior generations. Um, and that these folks really want to take transit and they want the freedom that comes with, with not being stuck in traffic. Um, that that's changing on its own. So I think you just gotta keep a stiff upper lip until that happens. <laughs> so thank you all for your attention. <clears throat> I'm going to I'm going to sprint to the book table where I will be signing books. Right over here.